I want to welcome everyone else into today's session. And uh, I want people who have uh, their mic on and they are not speaking to me, please. And so, uh, as I was saying that uh, I'd like to welcome every one of us into today's session, where we are looking at uh, the book of uh, the book of Matthew, chapter the book of Matthew, chapter twenty-eight, verse nineteen, and uh, the issue at hand is. Uh, how should we understand and follow this text? How should we baptize? Are there certain words or names we should mention at baptism? And uh, does this matter? And so it uh, is uh, a session of um, interaction. It's not a preaching. We would like to also welcome uh, Brother Robert uh, Mosinger and uh, Brother, you are welcome. And uh, before we go too much into the session, I'd like us to pray and then uh, we can be able to begin uh, the session. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you once again for guiding us until this moment. We are praying that the Holy Spirit uh, may uh, uh, abide with us and even guide us into all truth and uh, the things that we speak we may be of one mind lord esteeming each other and having the brotherly love and so bring our minds together that as we discuss this Satan may not get a foothold in anything but um, the heavenly angels may be in control of everything uh, take charge of these two poor feeble instruments that we are using and let them be used for this moment for the glory and honor of thy name. And so abide with us, I pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, we, we, we had uh, Brother uh, Zadok moderating. The, ish, the 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 session, but uh, he he has not come in, and so uh, I just want to welcome us once again. That um, this is, uh, I believe, the continuation of uh, what we had on day one, where we explored the book of uh, Matthew chapter twenty. Eight, verse 19, if uh, it was an interpolation or uh, uh, if there was any possible interpolations or how do we deal with the text and the what uh, inspiration or what EGY talks about it. And so it is a kind of continuation, but not a continuation, but now looking at uh, the various issues that uh, have been raised. And uh, as uh, many of you understand that um, there has been an issue or uh, 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 there has been, uh, let us say some debate on uh, uh, how we should baptize. Should we use the name of Jesus only? or uh, can we use the threefold name also? And uh, we have reached to an extent that uh, this tends to be separating uh, our brothers. This uh, tends to be uh, separating our brothers, which uh, should not be happening as we speak, but uh, we need to press together and uh, find uh, a line where uh, we can be of one accord and uh, one issue and the other should not be actually separating us because uh, 
this unity only brings weakness, but uh, unity actually brings uh, a strength. And so uh, I'd like us to talk freely about, um, are there any repercussions? Are there any implications uh, spiritually that uh, if we do not use the exact words, of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it's a problem. Do we view it as an, a, a liturgy that uh, without using it, then the presence of the Holy Spirit cannot be with us? Are there, are there words of uh, invoking uh, the Holy Spirit? And if they are not used, then uh, 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 the Holy Spirit will not be able uh, to be in our presence and uh, to minister unto us. This is the things that uh, I like to hear from us, brethren, as uh, we really discuss this issue. So I welcome everyone. You are uh, you are free to share your ideas in how you view the text, and um, if uh, it brings a problem to you if we don't use the right words in, uh, if we don't use the words in Matthew chapter twenty-eight verse nineteen, or if we use them, you are offended because you think they are trinitarians and. Uh, the, the text is interpolation. Welcome. Uh, Brother Sammy, I would like to add a few thoughts if that's okay. That is okay, Brother Robert. Go ahead. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank you all for inviting me. It's, it's so nice to be here, and, and I'm um, encouraged to see these discussions that are going on um, between you all over some of the same things that we've been discussing in meetings that we've had for the last couple of years. Um, and obviously, uh, Matthew 28, 19, and 1 John uh, 5, 7 um, have a lot of controversy surrounding them, but to me, uh, it, it I accept the text as they are, even 1 John 5, 7, even though I know it's the interpolation. Uh, I don't see a problem with accepting the text because neither one, number one, neither one teaches a trinity. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, Matthew 28, 19 does not uh, teach a proper formula, um, as is evidence in the book of Acts. So, um, so from the higher criticism standpoint, I would say we can take the text just as they read. Um, we can take Matthew 28, 19. Uh, we can take 1 John 5, 7. I think we should embrace them. Uh, but we need to understand and, and help people understand that they don't teach a trinity and, and it does not teach a formula. Um, now, the formula is the issue. That's the thing that we're talking about today. So um, the first thing I would question I would have is um, in response to the question you asked, Brother Sammy, um, are we denying the Father and the Spirit if we only baptize in the name of Christ? Uh, that would be a logical question, right? Because if we baptize in the name of Christ, does that mean we're excluding the Father and the Spirit? Uh, and my studies have convinced me that that is a logical fallacy. There's no such thing. Um, people can believe that. They can think that, oh, well, you baptize in the name of Jesus, so you're, you're rejecting the Father and the Spirit. Um, but I don't think they have any biblical um, basis for that, uh, especially considering um, the Father's name is in Christ, Right. Uh, and the spirit itself is not some separate thing that we need to give a name, a throne, a body to. Uh, the spirit is, operates as it's an office. We could say um, we could use that term as an office work, uh, but it's not its own separate thing that we need to honor and praise. I think there's a there's a real concern, at least in my mind, of, of people uh, giving the spirit a name, giving it, a, you know, there's some people that want to give it a body. They can't. Um, but they want to give it authority, like it's its own authority, you know, separate from the Father and Son. And that, that would be a concern to me um, on that note. But, um, you know, as I've looked at this thing, you know, I recognize that if Ellen White had never quoted Matthew 28, 28 19, we, we probably wouldn't be having this debate, right? Uh, she never quoted uh, 1 John 5, 7. So that one's, you know, everybody's pretty okay with saying, hey, that's an interpolation, right? Uh, but Matthew 28, 19, that's a little different. Um, people see that differently. And again, my opinion is we take both texts. We don't need to, we don't need to take them out. I mean, we can look at the history. We can, but you know, um, 
if we start taking text out of the Bible, then people are going to say, well, we can't trust the Bible. So uh, I don't have a problem using those texts because, again, I think we can uh, show pretty plainly that, you know, they don't teach a trinity and they don't teach a formula. But um, I have seen this debate for a couple of years now. OK, I, I saw this, you know, when it really became an issue within this movement. Um, I was a part of groups where this issue came up. I've seen churches, I've seen ministries that will no longer work together. They, won't even, they don't even want to talk together anymore over this issue. Um, and I'll just be upfront. I think that the proper mode of baptism is to baptize in the name of Christ, the name of Jesus. He's our, he's our watchword. Christ's name is our watchword. But um, we've also, and I, I can speak for a group of people because um, the people I work with, we've all came to the same conclusion. We're not going to make it a test. If somebody wants to baptize in the threefold name, you know, as it's written in Matthew 28, 19, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge a brother for that. Um, you know, I, I don't see no place to do that. Uh, I, I want to give him liberty to do that, but you know, we need to have liberty the other way too. Uh, and you know, so I would say we could probably both agree that on both sides, there's, there's probably a fanatical side on each side, right? No, Matthew 28, 19, no name of Jesus only. Right. Uh, but we want, we want to be able to find harmony. We want to be able to work together with brethren. I, I hate this, this, this pains my heart that people are, are separating over this thing and it's a very real um it's a very real problem and concern in the movement and you know so it's something we need to talk about but um let me see here i'm trying to change my screen real quick i'm sorry it's my wrong notes uh so you know in the context of this this dispute uh, that came up because obviously there was a dispute that came between the disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus over baptism, right? Uh, but as I looked at this thing, as I studied it, I recognized, okay, the problem was that that's not where the problem started, okay? Uh, we have to go back to the Bible and we have to understand uh, what this debate was about, who it started with, and, and all that, right? I mean, those are relevant facts to look at. So, um, you know, the first thing I looked at when I, when I studied this is, first of all, John's baptism. Is there anything at all wrong with John's baptism? Uh, I had to look at that, right, because it's kind of relevant. That's, that's kind of the issue, you know, John's baptism versus Jesus' baptism um, and words proper and all that. But, you know, as I looked at John's baptism, it's, it's plain that John's teachings are in harmony uh, with Jesus's, right? Um, yes. You know, it was, you know, Jesus's baptism and John's baptism were both a baptism of repentance for remission of sins, both of them. Uh, it's pretty easy to show that from the Bible. And John's baptism uh, was a baptism of repentance and remission of sins with the promise of the Holy Ghost, right, or the Holy Spirit, uh, that they would be baptized with the Holy uh, Spirit and with fire. So, you know, I don't see anything at all wrong with John's baptism other than it was done in the name of John. And you might be saying, like, what do you mean by that? Well, yeah, it was it was John's baptism. Isn't that how it's referred to in the Bible? John's baptism, the baptism of John. Um, and so, you know, this baptizing was done in the name or authority of John. That's why it's John's baptism. Uh, but as we look at the as we look at this, this issue of baptism, you know, how did the disciples baptize? And that's, you know, a lot of people have pointed to the book of Acts and other places. Uh, where the disciples baptized in the name of Jesus or other uh, similar uh, variations. And, um, you know, so we either have to speculate, and I don't like doing this, beloved, we either have to speculate that the, the disciples did, in fact, you know, use the threefold name and it just wasn't recorded that way. Um, and I just, I don't like doing that. I don't like speculating about the scriptures. I like taking the Bible as it reads. Um, I like the idea that the father's name is in his son, right? And, and we can read that in um, uh, John 14, uh, 13 and verses 16 through 17. Jesus said, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the father may be glorified in the son. And check this out, verse 16. And I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither know, knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Uh, so right here in John 14, Jesus said, anything you ask in my name, the Father's glorified in, in, in asking his name. The Father's glorified, and, and Jesus will pray the comforter, and he shall be in you. Uh, I can see a threefold name right there. I don't know if anybody else can, but I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I see perfect harmony, um, you know, in baptizing in the name of Jesus and in baptizing in 
um, what has been termed a threefold name. And by the way, that's a that's a that's a term Ellen White used. She did use that that phrase uh, threefold name. But but what I like, beloved, is in Acts of the Apostles, uh, page twenty eight. It seems to kind of harmonize both of these concepts. So, and I'll go ahead and read it. I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this, but I just want to go over this again because it's it seems to harmonize very perfectly in my mind, anyways what's going on here, but it says the disciples were to carry forward their work in Christ's name. Their every word and act was to fasten attention on his name as possessing that vital power, which sinners may be saved. I'll just pause there. What's that vital power by which sinners may be saved? We could, we could say the third person of the Godhead, couldn't we? We could talk about the office work of the Holy Spirit, um, the character, the person of Christ in humanity, right? But their faith was to center in him who is the source of mercy and power. In his name, they were to present their petitions to the Father, and they would receive answer. They were to baptize in the name. I always point out that singular there. Understand that. There's this singular name. Um, they were to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next sentence. Christ's name was to be their watchword, their badge of distinction, their bond of union. The authority, that's key, the authority for their course of action and the source of, of their success. So, uh, nothing was be, to be recognized in his kingdom that did not bear uh, his name. So, uh, you know, I think we can take that text and, and we can find harmony there. Um, you know, again, I, I think the proper mode of baptism is, is to take Christ's name as our watchword and baptize in his name and authority, right? Which glorifies the Father and it gives us the Spirit, right? Uh, I don't see a problem with that. Um, I think we can, we can find harmony there. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my screen so I can get back to see. I don't know if there's any comments or if there's any, if anybody wants to um, add any other thoughts at this point. If not, I don't, I don't mind. I had a few of the things I wanted to, to kind of draw out for discussion. I'm just trying to, um, I'm just trying to reason with people. I'm just trying to look at it from both sides and see if we can find harmony on this. You know, can, can that, can that be possible? Some people don't think so. Some people have already, you know, they've drawn the line and they've separated and and they're fine with that. But, you know, I, I think we should look at this thing a little closer because I think I think we can find harmony here. I really do. Um, does anybody have any any comments on some of the points that I've, I've brought up, um, you know, specifically concerning the validity of Matthew 28, 19 and first John 5, 7? I mean, um, like I said, I don't have to, we don't have to take a show of hands, but most people would probably agree. First John five, seven is, is an interpolation, right? It was added, um, you know, but Matthew 28, 19, again, because Ellen White quoted it and whatnot, that seems to be where the contention is. Uh, but we, we can take both of these texts again. First John five, seven does not does not teach a trinity. They bear record that, that the father has life and that life is in his son. That's what they bear record of. That's first John five, 11. That's the record they bear. Uh, that God has this life and this life is in his son. Um, that's the way it works. Uh, that doesn't teach a Trinity. Um, even though people say there's three, there's three, there's three. They get hung up on that three. There's three, there's three, there's three. And we're like, yeah, but what do they bear record of? What is the record? Right? Because that's what we want to know. What's the record? What record do those three bear? Um, and they bear record that, that, you know, the father has a life in himself and that life is in his son. And we have access to that through his son. So, um, you know, I don't see a problem with the text itself. You know, I, I don't think it really matters. Um, you know, I know that the Catholics have claimed Matthew 28, 19 as their own. Again, I don't think that really matters. Uh, we, again, we can look at 1 John 5, 7. Uh, it's, most people would agree that, you know, that's, that's not a valid text, but, um, but we can accept it, right? We can still use that text and, and not do any harm to the scriptures and, and still show people the truth, even with a text that's supposedly Trinitarian. So, um, if that makes sense to, to you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Brother Robert. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Brother Zadok to take over. I was uh, just uh, holding in for him and uh, for you, for Brother Zadok and you, Brother Robert, so that uh, you may take charge of uh, moderating uh, the panel discussion. And so welcome, Brother Zadok. And uh, I know that uh, God be with the two of you as uh, you take us through this. Um, but as I hand over, I'd like just uh, to say something that um, um, uh, I, I, I don't find it. 
a problem per se uh, with uh, what has been presented or uh, 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 the issue of being baptized in the name of Jesus as uh, the apostles did in, uh, in the book of Acts or uh, if uh, uh, anyone will uh, uh, really baptize uh, as it is in the book of Matthew chapter 28 verses 19. I'll agree with the, the two. And uh, I wanted to re-echo what uh, Brother Robert uh, was saying that uh, the name of the Father is uh, uh, in the Son. The name of the Father is in the Son and uh, we don't have to doubt that when uh, uh, you read uh, Exodus 23 verses 21, beware of him and obey his voice, provoke him not. This is the angel of the Lord for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now, what name did actually the father give to the son? Uh, when we read Hebrews, actually, we are told that the son has received an excellent name more than the angels, and that is the name uh, Jehovah, uh, the, na the name Jehovah. And uh, we, Ellen G. White says that uh, when uh, the children of Israel had the uh, gone to Egypt and Moses was to go there, Moses asked the Lord, what is your name? What shall I tell them is your name? And the Lord told him that tell them I am who I am. Now the same name Jesus used, uh, uh, used it in, uh, in the book of uh, John. Now when you take the name Jehovah and uh, the name I am who I am, actually when translated it means eternal presence. And so when we are being baptized in the name of Jesus, actually, that is the eternal presence of the Father uh, and the Son through the uh, omnipresence of the Holy Spirit. And if you choose to say the Father, the Son, and uh, the Holy Spirit, there is no problem because uh, it is uh, more of what is in the name and what it signifies more than uh, uh, just uh, uh, the name as a title. That is what I'd like to submit for now as uh, I welcome uh, the two of you and other brothers to share what uh, they have. Thank you very much, Brother Sami, and uh, welcome, Brother Robert, uh, to this uh, discussion. I'm sorry for being late because uh, uh, I had to deal with some emergencies that kept me late. But I praise the Lord for the part of the submission that I have uh, found you making, which is really impressive. I don't know if I'll pull us back because I'm not sure what has been said and what has not been said. But really, when you are looking at the discussion of the first day, which is the possible interpolations in Matthew 28, verse 19, and first John chapter 5, verse 7, our main idea is, can we can we increase, establish the people in the scriptures? And can we increase their confidence in the scriptures? Which is a good thing because it is not proper, even if we have exhaustive evidence to begin poking holes and, and cutting sections of the scripture. Even of course, having the quotation in early writings 220, where we are told of the plans that the devil has had in the time past in the Bible, of course, to make uh, uh, tamper here and there. But also remember the, the hand of the Lord, it said, is upon the scriptures. Upon the scriptures, for what reason? To protect the scriptures. Remember, on day two, our, our main subject, uh, this was our conclusion. We are to establish the faith, the confidence of the people in the scriptures and in the spiritual prophecy. And so as we start this study for today, which is basically on uh, perhaps the form of words that needs to be used, must we use specific form of words or what does it really mean uh, when uh, someone chooses to use the formula uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 28, someone chooses to use the formula or rather in the book of Acts. And our brother, uh, Robert has brought us all the way from the time of John, because that is always a concept forgotten when actually we are discussing these matters. The, what, I mean, the baptism of John. And so we can be able to see that when you just look at the baptism of John, it was equally a baptism. Not, I don't think it was a lesser baptism. It was equally an important baptism. 
And you see that it did follow exact formula of words, perhaps the one that Jesus Christ gave in the Great Commission, Matthew 28. And it is not equally like the word in, in the book of Acts. But now I want to begin by asking us if what dangers would it bring if we take the position that Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 is an added text, because this is what I want us to clear first. Because there are two positions which are um, extreme positions that are held according to my view. One position is that we must baptize in the name of Jesus. We must baptize in the name of Jesus. And anyone who baptizes in the formula in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 is Trinitarian, or perhaps will be said to be using a text which according to many brethren is an added text. And, and that's why I am asking them, what is the effect of saying that Matthew chapter 28 is an added text? Because remember that one came on the first day where some of us held the view that Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 is an added text. Uh, 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 before anyone comments on that, remember last time uh, we were able to realize that Matthew chapter 28, the only reference or, or rather evidence that those who say it's added up is perhaps an article or uh, a writer by, um, I think it's uh, Ratzinger, I think Pope Ratzinger or something of the sort. But we say it again, we need two or more witnesses to establish a matter. We cannot use one to establish a matter. And that was just a, a snapshot of what I wanted to give. So what effect does it have on our ministry, on the trajectory of the gospel to suggest that Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 is added? If anyone who has submission, you are free to, uh, to say something. Brother Robert, what do you think would be the effect of suggesting that that verse is added so that we stick only to the formula in uh, or rather that that verse is added or is Trinitarian, what would you say? Oh, well, I would say in connection with the uh, 2520 uh, issue I've been dealing with recently, um, the seven times in Leviticus 26 uh, would be a similar um, a similar problem, right? Uh, this this kind of revolves around higher criticism, right? That's kind of the the first thing that comes out is you're 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 being a higher critic of the Bible. Um, but you know, from my studies, what I've studied, um, there's a reference. I don't have it handy. Uh, I think it might have been a manuscript release. It was a letter Ellen White wrote to somebody, but she mentioned that the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts had been preserved. Uh, and I believe that's the word that God preserved, the Hebrew and the Greek manuscripts. Now, we know that uh, even in the great controversy, it's, we're told that when copies of the Bible were few, learned men, thinking that they were making plain what was already plain, uh, they, they changed some words, right? Um, and they cause it to lean toward established ideas. So, you know, are we being higher critics by, you know, where Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, and we're criticizing that comma where it goes, right? Uh, we, we know that that comma changes, can change, the, that pause changes the, the meaning of the verse. Um, when we look at verses like Matthew 28, 19, and 1 John 5, 7, or Leviticus, seven times of Leviticus 26, are we being higher critics by um, what I would say rightly dividing the word of God? Uh, I don't think so. So what, what, harm could come from, um, you know, uh, not accepting Matthew 28, 19, or even 1 John 5, 7. Well, um, obviously, the uh, claim of higher criticism will, will be screamed from the rooftops. People will claim you're, you know, you're, you're causing people to, to not have faith in the Bible. And, and, and that's unfortunate, I think. But uh, I think that, you know, we can accept the Bible as a chain, right? A chain, one link, one chain linking to another, right? One link linking to another, if you will. Um, that's how we're described as the Bible linking together. And if there's a few texts, even if it's Matthew 28, 19 or 1 John 5, 7, whatever it is, we can't ever take those few texts and, and interpret and change the whole chain of theology. Um, that's not the way it works. Those texts are supposed to come in harmony with the majority. So, um, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to um, 
to reject either Matthew 28, 19 or 1 John 5, 7. I think we need to keep both of them uh, just, just to help keep some of the higher criticism down. I don't think it's higher criticism at all, um, but that will be the charge that will come forward as you're being a higher critic. Um, I don't think we have to do that. I think we can take the Bible just as it reads, and we just need to know how to navigate it. Uh, again, I'm, I'm convinced that the Hebrew and the Greek manuscripts were preserved. King James is a great Bible, don't get me wrong, but it's not perfect. Uh, we know that. Those of us who have studied it and we understand there's a few problem areas, we've, we've come across those things. Um, you know, that doesn't mean God didn't preserve his word. Again, in that statement where Ellen White talked about a few, you know, the Bibles being uh, few in number, um, she mentioned that statement about a chain. You know, if we take the Bible as a whole, one chain linking to another, right? That's what we want to do. Um, so um, the concern I have with in light of this, this discussion is those who are taking the extreme views um, of one or the other. Again, I've already stated my view. I believe in the name of Jesus is the proper way. I don't believe Matthew 28, 19 was ever meant to be a formula, uh, but I'm okay with brethren who want, I want to give my brethren liberty to baptize that way. If they're convinced, if, if that's their conviction, uh, you know, I know other people that are convicted. They want to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Do we deny those people that right? See, that's, that's the problem we're having. Are we going to start kicking people out of the church because they don't want to be baptized a certain way? I, I can't do that. I've not, I've looked at this thing and I just, I cannot do that, even though, you know, I, I see points on both sides and I see what, uh, I just cannot harmonize that, um, especially considering if we were to go to John chapter three, verse uh, 25, so John three twenty five it says, and this is, uh, John was baptizing near, uh, in, near Salem, and it says, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples. So take note of the parties. Some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. This is where the whole, the whole um, controversy over baptism started. Right here. Between who? Who are the parties? The disciples of John, who are jealous of Jesus, by the way. And the Jews, who are jealous of Jesus, by the way. Both parties are jealous of Jesus. It's pretty easy to prove that. Uh, that's, what, that's what started all this. Okay. Uh, John's disciples came uh, came to John and said, John, hey, you know, Jesus is baptizing too. They're all, all men are coming to him, right? That was the whole thing, right? Um, and John's disciples were jealous of that. Um, and, you know, so and if you look at this, if you look at this thing again, if you look at um, Matthew chapter 9, you will see John's disciples at it again. There, there's a common thread here. Um, and again, both of these groups, both the Jews and John's disciples were jealous of Jesus. Okay. People were coming to Jesus and it was, it was, they didn't like it. But in Matthew chapter nine, verses 14 through 15, we read again, then came to Jesus, or I'm sorry. Yeah. Then came to Jesus, Jesus, the disciples of John saying, why do we, the disciples of John again, and the Pharisees, there's your other party. Why do we, the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples, Jesus fast not. Right. So, you know, and we could go to Luke 5, 33 is another one. Uh, same thing. You had the scribes and the Pharisees coming unto Jesus and saying, speaking to Jesus, this is the scribes and Pharisees, Luke 5, 33. Why do the disciples of John, see it again, fast often and make prayers? So now it's not just about baptizing, right? It was words proper at baptism. But now they're talking about fasting. Now they're talking about making prayers. Do you see the common thread? So we have the disciples of John. They fast often and make prayers. And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine, Jesus, eat and drink. So I point that out because as I looked at this subject, I realized there was a common denominator here. Uh, and it was between the disciples of John and the Jews. And both groups are jealous over Jesus. And they're the ones that start picking away at, well, you're not using the proper words, right? And we're actually told plainly, Ellen White says, um, that it came to a point to where the disciples of John questioned the right of the others to baptize at all, right? And so, you know, as we step back from this, this whole baptism thing, all we have to do is ask our question or ask ourselves the question, what role am I playing, right? Am I being John's disciple? And am I, am I questioning the right of others to baptize, right? And telling them, well, if you don't baptize this way, you're disobeying Jesus, for example. Uh, and, you know, you know, we had that choice. We, we, you know, we have to make that, that choice. But again, if we look at this thing, you're going to see that the disciples of John and the Pharisees and the Jews and the scribes, they were always, it was, this is where the, the controversy began. Uh, I hope we can see that. We can understand that it started between the disciples of John who were jealous of Jesus, right? Hey, 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 John, all guys are, all men are going to Jesus now. We got a problem, right? They were jealous. 
the Jews, they didn't like it either, right? They didn't like all men coming to Jesus. He was, he was causing a, a shaking. He was causing an uproar, right? I mean, the things he said and spoke, it shook the very foundation of, you know, uh, the Jewish religion. So um, those are just a couple of things I would point out. So hopefully I answered your question, uh, Zadok, in regards to Matthew 28, 19. I think the harm in taking either one of these texts, 1 John 5, 7 or Matthew 28, 19, the harm is, you're, you know, you're accused of higher criticism. Now, I don't think that's a bogus argument, uh, but that, that's what will happen. That will be the result of that is you'll be accused of being a higher critic. So um, that's, you know, that's a good reason why I think uh, we should we should take the text, even even first John five, seven. Again, most people agree on that one. It's even in the SDA Bible commentary, um, you know, but we can take both of those texts um, and, and we can show how they don't teach a trinity. And, and we can show how the name or authority of Christ is the equivalent of the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think that's the best way to deal with it, is to help people understand that by baptizing in the name of the Father, or I'm sorry, and baptizing in the name of Jesus, you are baptizing in the threefold name, in a sense. I mean, you know, obviously the Father's name is in Christ. We know that. Uh, we know the Spirit doesn't have its own name. It's not its own, it's not its own authority, right? It doesn't have its own name. It doesn't have its own body. It doesn't have its own throne. Uh, so I have a, a lot of concern in wanting to give something like a name, for example, an authority to, to something that doesn't even exist outside of the Father and Son, if, if you know what I'm, if you see what I'm saying. Um, there's there's a, a real concern there to make the Holy Spirit this thing uh, that, you know, we, we worship, that we praise, that we give honor to. And it's just the ministration of angels ascending up and down the Son of Man, right? Uh, we understand it's that divine power, it's that channel that connects us to heaven. It's not something that we need to, to bow down and, you know, even John, poor John, he almost worshipped angels, right? He fell down twice. He was in the, in the presence of God, right? The power of God. And the angel says, no, 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 don't worship me, right? Get up. What are you doing? Um, so uh, I'll... I'll go ahead and open it back up for um, for thought. If there's any other questions or, or thoughts that that want to be shared, sure. If there's any other person, praise the Lord for that thought. Indeed, indeed, if we if we begin tearing down the Bible by taking a season and cutting off certain texts, then we are actually uh, creating trouble for ourselves who want to use it later to establish our eras in uh, in, in the Scripture, and so. It's, it's, it's more harmful to us than it for those who are out there. So we, we, we must, as a people, begin by establishing, especially as missionaries and especially as Bible workers who are going out there to reach out to people, we must begin by establishing the faith of brethren in the Bible as a sure word of God. And, 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 and I'm so thankful for that. And also a point to note, which you brought up, um, uh, if I would never so much, is the point of jealousy between the disciples of John and Jesus Christ and Jesus and Jesus Christ. Is there any other brother uh, or a sister with submission on, on, on the matter that I just asked on the danger of, of, of taking um, Matthew 28 verses 19 as an um, added text? Uh, you just uh, unmute yourself and, and share something before we, we make uh, another step in this discussion. Uh, like, uh, Sami, okay, okay, go ahead. I like just to say that uh, this jealousy that existed uh, amongst the disciples of Jesus, the Pharisees, and John the uh, John the Baptist, really uh, reached to uh, a state that uh, they could not correlate and uh, uh, they could not see that they were doing the same work. You have just to look at uh, the book of Luke chapter 9 uh, uh, from verses, uh, uh, verses uh, 49. Jesus talking to John, the disciple of John the Baptist. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And so 
you can see that um, when you start taking these positions and uh, 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 wanting the people to do exact things that you do, actually there is no correlation. And uh, at uh, the face value, it can be seen that uh, you people, you are doing some good work, but uh, what you are doing, you are tearing each other. And by the way, uh, I think it was by the Holy Spirit, by the presence of Jesus Christ that uh, really made uh, John to bring out what was in his heart so that uh, he may be rebuked and corrected and then uh, be able to be converted. Otherwise, he could have withheld it in his own heart and in the end, uh, it becomes um, uh, something that could have been bad to the ministry. And so if we will take that uh, Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 is an added text, then you will have really to throw out E.G. White and the inspiration on that and uh, be able to say that uh, when she quoted that uh, portion, uh, she was not inspired. And really this will bring a, a, a big problem. But uh, I thank Brother Mosinga on what uh, he has uh, really shared with us because I had prepared something of the exact uh, sentiments that he, he, uh, he was talking about. And uh, in John chapter 325, you find that they then arose, there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jewish about purifying. What was this purifying that they were talking about? This purifying, uh, Sister White in DA 178.2 says that it was about cleansing the soul from sin and uh, uh, cleansing the soul from sin or if uh, uh, whether the act of baptism purified the sinner from the guilt of sin. That is 2SP 68.1. So this issue of uh, does just not using the threefold name cleanse uh, the soul or it doesn't do anything. This was the issue uh, that they were differing about. And so, uh, and uh, you, you know, we, we say that we have a problem with Matthew chapter 28 verse uh, 19, but now brethren, I want you to notice something that when E.G. White is commending on the book of John chapter three verse 25, Jesus have not died. He has not ascended and come back to give what we call the commission in the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is way before, uh, and the disciples were baptizing before Christ uh, really died, ascended and came back on earth. And this is way before. And before that he had, uh, when uh, you look at DA 178, when he sent out the 12 and the 70, he sanctioned them to baptize and they baptized. If uh, you look below, uh, 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 they, they baptized on profession of the faith. They baptized in the name of the Father, uh, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is before the Great Commission was given in Matthew chapter 28, when they had been sent out and they were doing the work. Uh, John's, uh, uh, John's disciples were doing uh, some work somewhere and uh, Christ's disciples were doing some work somewhere. And so if we say that Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, was added, then how is it that even before the commission that the disciples were baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then we are told that uh, 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 the, 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 the baptism of uh, John was for repentance, and uh, the baptism of the disciples of Jesus Christ were for the profession of faith. What profession were they professing? Uh, the kingdom of God ha has come in your heart. This was what they were uh, speaking about. And uh, 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 when John was baptizing and his disciples, they were pointing to the kingdom coming. And so these are the issues that um, we have to go back to the history and look at them. Another point that uh, maybe uh, Brother Zadok, I wanted to submit is John 3, 11, uh, where John says, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance in view of the coming Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. 
Now, what is this baptism of the Holy Ghost that uh, actually John meant about? Uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, when uh, you look at it, we are told it was for, uh, for receiving the gifts. Uh, look at uh, AA 282.2. They were then baptized in the name of Jesus, and as Paul laid his hands upon them, they received also the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by which they were enabled to speak the language of other nations and to prophesy. So let us just try to put the things together, the two things together. The disciples of Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ could even ascend, come back and say that all authority in heaven and earth has been given, they baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then after ascension, we find in Acts, they baptized in the name of Jesus. And E.G. White says that uh, she doesn't see the, 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 the issue with the baptism of John or the words used there and the baptism of his disciples and the words used there. And so at the end of the, of the day, we cannot say that Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 is a liturgy of uh, words specifically that should be used to invoke the Holy Spirit to give the gifts to those who are actually being baptized. Anyone can decide to baptize either the way that the disciples baptized before even the Great Commission was given or how John used to baptize. And the words are accepted and uh, there should be no factions unless again we go to the issue that uh, the disciples in their infants remember this was in their infant they had not comprehended what comprehended what actually the gospel was all about they had not comprehended what all the gospel was all about and uh, as i finished there was something that eg white said which is so much important this high commission relates to the gospel this is baptism in John, in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 18 to 20, and what is happening in Acts. This high commission relates to the gospel of to faith, to baptism, to salvation, and to the spiritual gifts. Uh, my concern was that if we are still behaving like infants somehow, is it the reason why we are not receiving the spiritual gifts? Because this baptism has to do with the reception of the gifts. But now here we are, like the disciples in their infancy, uh, uh, talking about which words should be used uh, at the text of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, uh, 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 authentic or that. And this prevents the Holy Spirit from coming in and giving us the, the gifts that uh, we should use to finish up uh, the gospel. DA 181.2. I'll read this. The disciple of John had declared that all men were coming to Christ, but with clearer insight, John said, no man receiveth his witness. So few were ready to accept him as the savior from sin, but he had received his witness, had set his seal to this, that God is true. John 3.33. Now observe this. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. No need of disputation as to whether Christ's baptism or John's, bap or John's purified from sin. Whether those words used or whether these words are used or whether which baptism of repentance or profession of faith actually purifies us from sin. She says, it is the grace of Christ that gives life to the soul. Apart from Christ, baptism like any other service is a worthless form. So today you can choose that I'll baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Another one says, no, I'll baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. But what, what, is, what is the character that is really accompanying this? Without the abiding presence of Jesus Christ, all those baptism and whichever words that are used will avail to nothing. Thank you so much. Uh, amen to that and uh, thank you both of you for the submissions that you've made and I think we want to clear up with that point and we are simply seeing that Matthew chapter 28 is valid and an attempt to actually think it's either Trinitarian is to also make Sister White a Trinitarian, Panya Church a Trinitarian, an attempt to suggest also that it's added is to 
is to suggest that uh, perhaps uh, Sister White uh, was not under the direction of the Holy Spirit while quoting together with the Pioneer Church. But um, there is the other extreme, which I really want us to also talk about uh, before I really um, bring down the discussion into this issue of the form of work. Um, this has actually been, um, what you've discussed is actually the case whereby those who believe in the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ believes they are choosing it because it's either added or because um, or it's either added or because it's, um, it's Trinitarian. But there is also the old concept of those who reject the other form of baptism, like the one in Acts, and then says that uh, the form of words that must be used is uh, the one in Matthew chapter 28. So there, here comes my question, um, and which, which of course some of you have already addressed, but for clarity, we need to go over it again. I mean, is the form of words that important? I know, I know probably we will pull out the quote which will show that, but I want us to elaborate more, is the form of words. And what about a case where a brother chooses to baptize and does not use the exact words in Matthew 28 and in John, but still baptizes in the name, in the character of Jesus Christ? What would you say about that? I think, Brother Zadok, I'm compelled to uh, give the first submission o o on, on that, that um, uh, I'll repeat what I have just read in the closing uh, and as I, as I give my submission. No need of disputation as to whether Christ's baptism or John's purified from sin. Uh, it is the grace of Christ that gives life to the soul. Apart from Christ's baptism, like any other service, is worthless form. So this is not an issue, uh, I, I believe, of um, which words will you use? Because if we say that uh, we must have exact words, then uh, we shall have a liturgy. And then what, what are we going to do? We are going to have a creed. And then what do we do with the Holy Spirit when we have formed a creed? Then the work of the Holy Spirit is not there, but the works of men. But if you say that you will hang on the words of, I'll baptize in the name of Jesus. Uh, how, how, what do you do? How do you harmonize with E.G. White? But um, you ask a, a, a question that uh, I will like to bring another principle in it. Uh, the disciples baptized in the name of um, Jesus after Christ had ascended, but before that they baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we find that um, all this was accepted. And uh, John's baptism, which actually maybe never mentioned anything, what Brother Mosinger has said, uh, uh, has inferred that uh, maybe it was the baptism of John in the name of John, uh, which means uh, in, in repentance of sin. Um, and Jesus says, E.G. Uh, White says that, uh, all that was in harmony with what actually Jesus was doing, and there was no problem, there was no need for uh, disputing. But the principle I wanted to bring is this, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, uh, Brother Mosinger also pointed out that um, there was not only the disputing about uh, baptism, but also prayers. One day, the disciples of Jesus Christ found him so um, uh, uh, amazed in prayers, uh, immersed in prayers, and they told him, teach us how to pray like how John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And then Jesus goes ahead. He, he doesn't go into this dispute about John and him. He just tells them in Matthew chapter 6 that when you pray, pray like this. I want to ask us, do we repeat the same, same words that Christ says that when we pray, we should pray? And if we say no, and then we hold to the ideas that it is the name of Jesus that we should baptize it, or it is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that this should be, then uh, I will say that carry the same principle to the prayers. And if you are not praying as Jesus said you should pray in Matthew chapter 6, then you are not praying at all. 
but who is able to accept such a thing? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Brother Robert, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we can, um, we can set up these tests, right? I mean, you know, we can, there's all kinds of churches that do it. Like uh, Brother Sammy said, I mean, we can get a list of, you know, we have our fundamentals and these are principles, understand, you know, but we, we can, we can make a list of a creed, right? We could, we could do that. Um, but we don't want to do that because uh, as Brother Sammy pointed out, we could do, if we do that with baptism, then it's just a step away from prayer, right? We can make prayers like the, the Pharisees, right? Because that was another issue that the disciples of John brought out. Um, and and fasting, right? We can all we can, we can also start, you know, determining how our members fast, when they fast, what they fast, how long they fast. Um, you know, we can we can do those things. We could do that, but is that what Christ wants us to do? Uh, I don't think so at all. You know, I was just thinking of this reference in uh, Signs of the Times, September twentieth, eighteen ninety nine. It's it's the one uh, where Ellen White quotes Matthew twenty eight, uh, eighteen through nineteen, and she talks about the the words being upon his lips. Uh, but I, I just want to quote after she quotes Matthew 28, uh, 18 and 19, she says, just before he left them, Christ gave his disciples this promise of the Holy Spirit. And while the words were upon his lips, what words? The promise of the Holy Spirit. And you read the rest of the content, you'll see that's the focus is the Holy Spirit. He ascended. A cloud of angels received him and escorted him to the city of God. The disciples returned to Jerusalem, knowing now that Jesus was indeed the son of God. Their faith was unclouded, and they waited for the fulfillment of the promise, preparing themselves by prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we could we could we could chant the right words. Right? We could we could recite the right words. We can use water, right? Full immersion and everything. But I'm telling you, without Christ, you just got a wet person there. That's all you have. Um, you know, you don't have you don't they don't have what they need, right? Um, we can go around baptizing people all day long and putting them under water, and, and it does no good. If they don't have the gospel in their heart, they don't, they don't know the truth, right? They don't know that there's a God in heaven. They don't know what sin is. They don't know the sanctuary. That's what they need to know. That's what we need to be teaching them. Now, hey, you got to say this, right? You know, they need to understand the plan of salvation. They need to understand who God is. They need to understand what sin is. And they need to understand the sanctuary so they know how God's dealing with the sin problem. Um, you know, that's, that's the focus. But the reason I quoted that is because over and over and over, you'll see the, the focus of, of this baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have water immersion, but again, uh, the whole thing of baptism is a new creation, right? Um, and that's what baptism is a symbol of. It's a symbol of a new creation. And, you know, God wants to do that. He wants to create in our, he wants to give us new hearts. He wants to um, put his law in our hearts. And so, you know, there's one more statement that I'll read. And, and just because it kind of goes in connection with this, this is another one uh, that is highly um, used for those who, who advocate, you know, a formula. Uh, this comes from uh, Testimonies, volume six, page 91. It says, Christ has made baptism the sign of entrance to his spiritual kingdom. His what? His spiritual kingdom. He has made this a positive condition with which all must comply who wish to be acknowledged as under the authority, as under the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before man can find a home in the church, before passing the threshold of God's spiritual kingdom, he is to receive the impress of the divine name, the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23, 6. Baptism is a most solemn renunciation of the world. Those who are baptized in the threefold name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the very entrance of their Christian life declare publicly that they have forsaken the service of Satan and have become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. They have obeyed the command, come out from among them and be you separate and touch not the unclean thing. And to them is fulfilled the promise, I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So, I read that I read that statement because it had that threefold name. Maybe you saw that that threefold name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, my my conclusions is that a lot of people read that threefold name as some people read third person of the Godhead. Now, what do I mean by that? Right? Ellen White used the term third person of the Godhead, didn't she? Uh, but she didn't mean a third person as in like what corporate teaches, right? This third you know guy without a body and he floats around and you know, we don't, we don't believe that, right? But we believe that she used that term, third person of the Godhead. And we understand there's a proper understanding of what she meant by that. The author um, clarified that. Well, um, you know, we look at this concept here of a threefold name. Well, what does that mean? Well, 
Um, I think some people are reading into those texts. I think some people like John's disciples and the Pharisees, they're becoming unnecessarily jealous um, over this issue. Again, uh, is baptism important? The ordinance of baptism? Absolutely, right? Is, uh, is praying important? Absolutely. Fasting? Yes, absolutely. All three of those things are important, right? Uh, we would agree with that. But we understand that there, there's, um, I don't know what else to call it except fanaticism. You know, when, when we start setting up false tests, when we start making, you know, and, and we start kind of whittling down and, and taking away liberty, because that's what we're doing. We're, we're, you know, we're taking away uh, the liberty of our brethren, right? Because we want to make them just like us, apparently. But, you know, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. You know, again, go back to Romans 14. This, this issue with John's disciples wasn't just specific to prayer. Uh, it was also to praying. It was also to fasting. Um, and so we need to understand that, you know, again, we're talking about a spiritual kingdom. Uh, we're talking about, you know, to receive the impress of the divine name, the Lord, our righteousness, right? Uh, so I say that because um, years ago, I come in contact with a movement known as the sacred name or a doctrine known as the sacred name, right? And, and people were going around and are still doing it today, teaching that, you know, it's, it's the only proper way is, is to, you know, use Hebrew names, right? Um, and uh, we... Um, I just don't want to get caught up in that. I think, I think we just, we need to study the scriptures. We need to understand, you know, um, what the fundamentals are, you know, baptism, for exa example, that's a fundamental principle. But if you'll look at those fundamentals, you'll notice something about those fundamentals. Matthew 28, 19 is not, I repeat, it is not listed uh, as a reference in the 1872 or 1889 fundamental principles of Seventh-day Adventists, even though uh, men like James White and others advocated using, you know, uh, that name, uh, the threefold name, if, if, you know, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they baptized that way. They even advocated it. But, you know, we just have to decide, you know, at what point are, are we, I mean, are, are we comfortable kicking people out of the church? Because that's the way I look at it, you know, because people come into the church, they, they want to be a part of the church, right? They, they want to be baptized. It's a public renunciation of the world, right? I'm now a follower of Christ. But if we're going to deny people being a part of the church because, you know, our rules say you have to baptize this way, um, you know, what's that going to do? We're, we're, you know, and that's why, I mean, I, I see it now. I've seen it personally firsthand. I see ministries separating over this issue, right? People separating over this issue. And I just don't think there's, there's any, any point in it. Again, Acts of the Apostles 28.2, I believe. Uh, it seems to harmonize any seeming contradiction. Uh, they baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but yet Christ's name was their watchword, right? Uh, I just, I love that text. It seems to bring it all together. And, you know, I think that, you know, people uh, who are interested in studying this, who are interested in, in working together and presenting a united front so we can close up this work and go home, I think they're going to see through this. They're going to see through, um, and it's not just baptism. Understand, there's all kinds of fanaticisms. There's heresies too, but, you know, we're talking, you know, it becomes fanatical when we start trying to fine tune and, and split hairs over the minor points of a greater fundamental, right? The greater fundamental is that, you know, baptism is a sign of entrance into the spiritual kingdom, right? Uh, that, that water doesn't save you, right? The, the proper words, even if they're recited right, that doesn't save you, right? Brother Sammy read the, the text earlier uh, about forms, and, and I've got a couple on, on um, some notes that I put together. Uh, we don't want to be self-righteous formalists, right? We don't want to be like the Jews. I mean, you know, they had it all figured out, right? They knew how to pray. They knew how to fast. Apparently, they knew how to baptize. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to be like those guys. So, you know, let me just leave you with this thought. As we consider this whole issue over baptism, step back, take a look at who is debating. Who, who are the ones that are fighting over this? You had John's disciples and the Jews and the Pharisees and the scribes, all those guys. Both of these groups are jealous of Jesus, and they're the ones picking away at, you know, and causing problems. So don't miss that point. I think it's super important. We need to understand that, you know. And again, in the context of baptism, you know, are we, are we, it doesn't matter if we call ourselves John's disciples, or Jesus' disciples, or whatever, are we questioning the right of others to baptize, you know? And if so, we know, we can know for sure which party, which camp we're a number of, of those who are questioning the right. So I, you know, I just say that as a word of caution to those who insist on doing that. I, again, I, I think people should step back and look and, and try to see how this harmonizes, uh, even if they have a very strong uh, 
uh, opinion on one side or the other. Uh, again, this isn't about us. This is this is about Christ, and and that's that's what drew uh, this this debate in the first place. That's what caused the debate in the first place. You had John's disciples who were jealous, and the Jews who were jealous, both jealous of Jesus, right? So let's not be jealous of Jesus. Let let's bring all these people to Jesus in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, right? Uh, if they have Jesus in their heart, that's all that matters, right? Um, otherwise, they're just wet. Otherwise, we're just chanting words, and, and it means nothing. So hopefully um, hopefully that's been helpful to some of you. Um, just sharing some of my thoughts. I'm, I'm open to hearing other thoughts. I, I think uh, these meetings like this, that's why I'm encouraged uh, that you guys in, in Kenya are doing this. I think this is important. This is how we're going to come together, work out these things. And ultimately, uh, the goal is to, to have a united front, right? Um, we want the world to be able to see Christ in us, right? Uh, that we may all be one, right? That we may all be one. So um, God will do that. It's, it's just going to take time, right? We have to work through these things. So uh, again, I appreciate you all letting me share my thoughts here. And um, I'm sure there's more things I could share too. You know, if, if we uh, continue the conversation much longer, I don't know how much longer we have, but uh, I'll go ahead and um, open that up for somebody else to comment. Yeah, sure. We still, thank you, brother Robert. We still have a few more minutes to continue the conversation and yeah elder Kiefer, you are asking before i give another one uh, any other of these people chance you're asking i don't understand your question but you're asking something like um uh the bible being a perfect chain um uh, i mean how do we understand that uh, perhaps you could elaborate so that uh we could be able to see if someone could react to that well, I mean, I would just take the person right to the book of Acts and say, how did the disciples baptize? Um, you know, that's that's what I would do. I would say the Bible's a perfect chain. It does, you know, link together. And, um, you know, we have that, that text, you know, here a little, there a little, right? I mean, that's how we study doctrine. Uh, we gather as much information as we can about it, and, and we try to make sense of it, right? Um, there's, you know, again, I've been looking at this thing with baptism for over two years, and maybe some of you others ha have been as well, and maybe even longer, I don't know. Um, but when it became an issue, when I saw it became an issue, it caused me to look at it closely. And so I had to make a decision, you know, again, in my mind, am I willing to kick somebody out of the church over this? Right. Um, and, and if I do that with baptism, then I, I can I can just step over. and I can do that with prayer. And now we can have, just have a preamble. Right. We can have the Lord's prayer as a preamble to every public prayer. Does that you know, some people might think that makes sense. I don't. I, I think that's a very bad idea. Um, and same thing with fasting, right? Because that's what the disciples of John were complaining about. And you can read it in Romans 14, right? Keeping a day and not keeping eating and not eating, right? They want to be over that. Um, John's disciples want to be, and, and the Jews, they want to be over all that. They want to meddle in that kind of stuff. I don't. I want to, I want to point out the black and white, right? We don't need to eat clean and unclean, or unclean meats, right? Uh, there's certain things that stand out that are black and white. There are some gray areas, right? And so rather than trying to, to get down and, and our brother and sister and try to, you know, make them think and, and eat and, and pray just like we do, we need to give them liberty. We need to allow them to, you know, uh, to ask God, you know, what he would have them do. Um, and so that's that's the biggest problem I see with a lot of these different ideas is, is it becomes fanaticism. It, it becomes this idea of trying to control what somebody eats, what somebody drinks. What, and is eating important? Is drinking important? Is baptism important? All these things are important. Um, but when we start splitting hairs on the minor points of a greater fundamental, I mean, we have what we see today in the movement. We have all this disunity. We have people who are taking sides and, and, and they're splitting and guys, I'm tired. I want to go home. Anybody else want to go home? I, I want to get this over with. I'm tired of being here. I'm tired of sin. Um, and the only way that's going to happen is, is, you know, we get our acts together and we, we properly warn this world. We present a united front. Uh, we preach the same thing and, um, you know, the world can be warned, warned and the final events will happen. So, um, yeah. So again, yeah, back to your question, uh, Zadok, the, the Bible is a perfect chain. One piece links to another. If you have a few links that seem to be out of harmony, set those over to the side. Don't like, don't, don't fret over them, set them over to the side, you know, gather everything. And, and once you got kind of have a pretty good picture, then you can see how those other ones work into there because they have, they're not going to contradict the whole. Right. Um, that's how we want to build our chain. One piece linking to another. Right. Um, and I think if we do that, if we study the Bible like that, I mean, that's that's why most of us are Adventists now. Right. Many of us probably weren't born Adventists. I wasn't. I'm a convert. 
but I started studying the Bible, specifically prophecy. I started seeing how one how one chain linked to another, and you know, or one link, you know, and, and there was this beautiful chain. I could see this chain of prophecy. I could actually see the church. That's why I'm an Adventist. I could actually see the church come out of the wilderness, right? Um, why? Because one thing links to another, right? The Bible does that. And so hopefully, if anything, you know, people will be able to, to look at this idea uh, of baptism, take a step back, look at what all the tension and where all this controversy started at. Because understand, you know, there was no controversy until those two groups started bickering and, and pointing fingers and, and setting up tests. So um, we, we don't want to miss that point. If I think if we miss that point, then we're going to get caught up in all the other. We step back and we realize, OK, where does things start? between who and what were the issues and, you know, what, what is baptism all about? If we start asking reasonable questions and we just look at the whole thing, I think it becomes pretty clear, even though, you know, Matthew 28, 19 seemed to teach a Trinity, even though Matthew first, uh, I'm sorry, first John five, seven seemingly teaches a Trinity. We know it doesn't, right? Uh, we know better. Why? Because we know that the rest of the chain, right. That's all linked together. Won't allow that. Right. It has to be in harmony with those. So hopefully that helps. I don't know. Um, those are just yeah, thank, my you. thank you so much, uh, Brother Robert, for uh, uh, those thoughts. The, indeed, the Bible uh, is a perfect chain. And the fact that we don't understand uh, certain portions of the Bible does not uh, bring us to a point where we have to think that they are not part of the scripture. We have to spend time, pray about it, and ask God how it harmonizes with the truths that is already Build and establish. And so I think um, uh, our conversation is good so far, and we are, we are learning to avoid that both uh, two ex extreme views that actually brings in fanaticism in the movement, whereby one group insists that this is the form of words you must use, and if you don't use them, then you are not part of this group. And the other says, hey, this is how it must be done. So the two extreme views. Are, are, are actually inroads of fanaticism. But, but again, um, I would like to ask about rebaptism because there is this thought and uh, that perhaps if you're not baptized this way, then you perhaps need a rebaptism into the, into the movement or into a church. I don't know if any of you have come across that concept, but oh, I have come across that whereby you're told that Yes, you believe the truth and you have been walking in the light that the Lord has been revealing to you and you have been daily perfecting a Christian. But because you are not baptized this way, you feel that you need a rebaptism. What would we say about that? Perhaps for... Uh, uh, Brother Robert, is there any person who has uh, thought about that? Uh, I'll go ahead and comment. I'll just share a personal testimony. Um, I was baptized in a Protestant church, and I'm pretty sure the, pa the pastor probably baptized me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, too, right? Um, you know, but, you know, I, I became an Adventist in 2009, so I became a Protestant Christian back around 2003, um, and by 2009, I became an Adventist and um, doctrinally. Now, I never became an actual member of the church, but, you know, rebaptism is something that has been on my mind, even after uh, understanding the truth about God, right? Um, it's like, well, do I need to be rebaptized? That's, that's a very legitimate question. And I see nothing at all wrong with, with rebaptism, you know, people recommitting their lives. I mean, again, it's just an ordinance. That, that baptism, that water, uh, you know, all that stuff, all those, all those forms, that doesn't save you. Jesus is what saves us. We understand that. We have to have Jesus. Without that, we're just wet, right? We're just wet baptismal candidates, right? Um, we don't want that. Uh, we we want you know we want people's hearts. We want we want Christ in their hearts. That's what we want. Uh, we don't want just wet people baptized into the church because they agreed with our formula, right? We don't want that. We don't want that at all. Um, so the, you know the idea of rebaptism. I think it's a good idea. Uh, people should reconsider it. I, I've considered it. You know. Um, just because I was baptized in a Trinitarian church. I was baptized in a non-denominational Sunday keeping church, you know, and when I came out of it, you know, I, I found Adventism 
but I seen there was some problems with Adventism. So I didn't want to get baptized there. They, they actually have their baptismal thing you had to agree with. You know, they got their 13 points, 13, by the way, there are 13 points uh, of their baptismal thing that you have to agree to, you know, like this is the remnant church. I'm going to support it with my tithes and offerings and all these things you had to agree to. Well, I wasn't convinced that that was the remnant church. I mean, they had a lot of stuff, but I wasn't. Convinced. So I didn't, you know, we never became baptized members, um, you know, and if it weren't for that, I mean, I would have considered, you know, maybe I would have considered, I don't know. Um, but I think people that, that, you know, if it's on their hearts to be rebaptized, they feel like they need to make a public uh, expression like that. Go for it. Do it. I think they should. I think that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and again, on the idea of uh, baptismal formulas, that should be between the baptismal candidate and, and the local church or the, the person baptizing. You know, I mean, we should give them that liberty. I think we should be free to be able to give them that liberty and not think, oh, well, yeah, those guys are heretics baptizing in the name of whatever. Uh, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to give that, um, that, that appearance, right? We don't want people to think that, um, at least I know I don't, I, I, you know, but yeah, so I think rebaptism is a good idea, Brother Zadok. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, even baptism in general, I mean, the thief on the cross, he wasn't baptized. So do we use that as, a, as an example to not get baptized, right? We don't want to do that. Uh, we know if we, if we can, we should, right? If we can, we should. Um, it's not it's not a prerequisite. I mean, you're not going to be I mean, the thief on the cross. He's a perfect example. Right. He's a perfect example of somebody who can waste his whole life and then be saved right there at the very end. Right. We don't want to be him, though, just because God made provision for that doesn't mean we want to be that guy. Um, you know, uh, so, yeah, those who those who want to be rebaptized should consider it. those um, who are considering this baptismal formula. They, they ought to consider leaving that to the back. I mean, think about this. I mean. You know, what if somebody's convicted, regardless of whatever Matthew 20, 19, maybe they just they don't like the way it sounds. OK, maybe they do think it's Trinitarian and they're convicted in their heart. They want to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Are, who are we to deprive them and say, no, no, we're going to be your conscience for you. That's not right, uh, especially when we have so many examples of, of you know, the disciples. And, and, you know, we're trying to harmonize these two. That's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. You know, I, I don't want people to, to get off in one ditch or the other. I can see harmony and I want, you know, I want people to find that harmony. I want people to re recognize that there's, there's bigger issues. You know, the, the greater fundamental is the ordinance of baptism, which is what it is a sign. It is a symbol. It is a form of itself that does not save you. Matter of fact, it's supposed to be a symbol of what's already happened inside of you, right? That, that's what baptism is. It's a form. And if we make these forms and make no mistake about it, the Jews were really good at forms. Right. Does anybody doubt that? I mean, they had they had it down. They knew they knew, um, you know, and we could be like that, too. We can we can get our religion. We can dot all our I's and cross all our T's and, and have this nice little pretty thing that we show everybody. But without Christ, what is it? You know, it's desolate. It's desolate without Christ. Um, we got to have Christ in there. So, you know, that that's the main thing. That, and that's why when you look at John's baptism, yeah, he, he baptized for repentance and remission of sins with the promise of what? The baptism of the Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit. Uh, that's that's the, the regenerating agency, right? The third person of the Godhead. It's through that agency uh, that, you know, we become partakers of the divine nature, that we overcome sin, that we become these new creations, right? Because we can't do it on our own. I mean, I can't make a new creation on my own. <laughs> it just doesn't work, right? I mean, I can try, but I fail. Uh, but, you know, when we tap into that divine power, that channel that God has given us, that agency, you know, we're able to live victorious lives. And, and that's what baptism is a symbol of. It's dying to the world and, and alive in Christ, right? And if, if that's our focus, and if we can give ministers and the baptismal candidates, if we can let the local churches and people make that decision on their own, you know, a conscious choice, because again, I've seen people on both sides. I know people on both sides, you know, um, and I'm not okay with casting them out of the church. I'm just not okay with it. I am okay with calling out those who are becoming fanatical. I am okay with that because, um, you know, they're troubling and they're, they're drawing people away from Christ, actually, is what it's going to do. It causes dissension, um, you know, so, um, you know, we just need to be mindful of those things. Uh, words don't save us, right? Again, think about sacred name, you know, does that bring us closer to heaven because we, you know, use Yahweh and Yeshua, Yeshua, what, you know, whatever pronunciation you want to use, does that really bring us closer to heaven? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that saying a, a magical formula as if that has some kind of power, there's no power in those words. The power is what's going on in the heart. <laughs> That's the power. That's what's going in the mind, right? The heart and the mind. 
uh, that's what's going on. Again, otherwise we just have forms. We just have water. We just have a minister. We just have all these things, but without Christ, what is it? We got to have Christ in it. So. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I'll thank you so much, uh, brother Robert again. And, uh, elder care for what you're bringing up exactly. Yes. The Bible is a perfect chain. You say again, and, and, and that, um, Jesus Christ, um, is everything to us and that's why it's in the name of jesus christ it's in the authority in the character of jesus it's not about the form of the words and you are bringing in a very good point uh and uh, my brother uh, robert a uh, point whereby we leave it with the minister and uh, the the candidates who are going to be baptized and suppose uh, a candidate comes and tells me uh brother elder pastor i want to be baptized in the name of jesus I don't think that we should make a show out of it. I mean, we should we should gladly baptize them because it's nothing to us who have understood that the form of words mean nothing, especially if we can tell in their lives. But you also bring a point that I want us to note and comment about and, and just make very clear that uh, in cases where people uh, become... Um, extreme and strict and stunned uh, in the fact that they think that this is the formula to be followed. And there, I think, uh, personally, as Zadok, I think in, 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 in such cases, it's the work of the faithful ministers to rebuke that. Um, I do not think that, that that amounts to actually bring a controversy of other words, but just trying to check the extreme of, uh, views that are being promoted by that particular brother. Perhaps if Zadok chooses today to insist that baptism must be in the name of Jesus and begins denouncing every member of the church that is not baptized in the name of Jesus and begins accusing every minister that baptizes is out in the name of Jesus or, or the other way, using Matthew chapter 28 strictly and begins denouncing everyone that Jesus then. I think it's the work of faithful ministers to point out that error. What do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. We have a responsibility to be watchmen and, and to, you know, again, I look at this as a huge violation of the liberty we have in Christ. Christians are given a certain amount of liberty in Christ. And I see this as a huge violation of that right. That's why I'm offended. That's why I'm, I'm trying to compel uh, you know, people to, to take another look at it because, um, you know, I, I've just seen firsthand, I've seen people just, you know, they don't want to work together over this, everything else except for this, right? Can you imagine that? I mean, doctrinally, I mean, we've got these big major fundamentals and we come to something like this and now we don't want to work together. Wow. I mean, that's, that's huge. Is it really that important? You know, are we, are we, are we over literalizing the scriptures? Um, you know, are we taking something too literal? I mean, because again, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of things. When you look at the debate, there's a lot of things that come up, right? Are we really okay with telling somebody that to baptize in the name of Jesus, you're rejecting the father and the spirit. I mean, we should be able to see that for the logical fallacy that it is that, that in no way denies the father and the spirit. We need to be able to understand that they're all operating and working under the same authority, right? I mean, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with threefold name. I don't have a problem with third person of the Godhead. I don't have a problem with Matthew 20, 19. I don't have a problem with first John five, seven. Um, we can take those texts as they read and, and we can work through the Bible and we can understand that, you know, there is no Trinity. So if, 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 if somebody reads Matthew 20, 19, they see a Trinity. It's because they read that into the text. Uh, if somebody reads first John five, seven, and they read a Trinity, uh, it's because they're reading that into the text. Uh, and the same thing happens in Leviticus 26 and other places. People read things in the text. But if you just actually look at the text, if you step back and, and you look at the, again, here a little, there a little, whatever we have to do, we have to take all the information from a subject, right, to be able to, to make a decision. And if we do that, uh, I see Brother Kifa has, has pointed here or asked a question here about, you know, taking the Bible as a perfect chain. Uh, yes, I, even in the book of Acts, you can see there's no consistent uh, formula. You know, it was the name of the Lord and name of the Lord Jesus and the name of Christ. Uh, there, so it wasn't even consistent in that respect, other than it was the authority of Christ that they went forward. That's, that's who commissioned us to go forward. Matter of fact, in Matthew 28, 17, Jesus said, just before he quoted the Great Commission, he said, all power has been given unto me. 
me. That's what he said. All power has been given unto me. Then he said, go for and baptize in the name, singular, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the same authority. Um, again, I, I can't, I can't, in my mind, I can't, I can't, I can't separate the two. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with, with the name of Jesus and the threefold name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being one and the same. Um, I can, I can reconcile that in my mind. Now, other people cannot. And I pray that, you know, they can, they can come to that conclusion. Um, again, because I mean, look at what we're saying. If we're going to take 28, 19 as a formula and it, it becomes a test, right? It's, you know, we, we can write it up, we can put it there and you can't become a member of our church until, you know, you comply to this. Uh, we could do that, but you know, who are we shutting out? How many, how many of Christ's followers are we going to shut out that way? Um, and does that mean that everybody that comes in that way is Christ's follower, right? Uh, there's no guarantee either way. Uh, but the bottom line is, I, I, here, I can just sum it up with this right here. Uh, this is a statement from Signs of the Times, January 11th, um, 1883. Uh, it says, no outward forms can make us clean. No ordinance, including baptism, administered by the saintliest of men. You can get the, the holiest man you can think of. None of that can take the place of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God must do its work upon the heart. All who have not experienced its regenerating power are chaff among the wheat. Our Lord has his fan in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. In the coming day, he will discern between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So I, I can't stress enough that no outward forms can take the place of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No outward forms. It doesn't matter how. I mean, we can dot all our I's, cross all our T's. I mean, we can do it perfect. That doesn't take the place of the baptism of Christ. And that, again, that's what John's baptism was. He baptized people for repentance and remission of sins with the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, and, and that's what we do. That's what we tell people. I mean, you know, again, yeah, we baptize people for the remission of sins and tell them that, you know, the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's the regenerating power they need in their lives. Uh, and we need to pray for that now. I'll say that now because we're living in the, in the final moments of our history. We need to be praying for the latter rain now like never before. Uh, we need to be praying. Um, yes, I will post that in there. I'm sorry. Um, we need to be praying for unity. We, we need to be um, working these things out. And again, looking at looking at the greater fundamental, because see, we could start splitting hairs on pretty much all the fundamentals. I mean, you can you can start getting down to the minutest point of, of the doctrine, right? Um, and, and it can cause a lot of problems, but, um, if we, if we take the Bible as a chain and one, one piece linking to another, and we look at the whole big picture, I think it, it tells a different story than what other people are saying. So that was, uh, signs of the times, January 11th. I'll post this reference in here for you. January 11th. So again, um, and okay, that was a private message. I'm sorry. I was sending a message to Ken. So that, that reference, again, I'll try to put this in there for everybody if everybody wanted it. Uh, it came from Signs of the Times, January 11th, 1883. So, But again, the, the point is no outward form. So, you know, we talked about baptism, you know, John's disciples and, and the Jews were also interested in, in prayers, right? Uh, they were interested in, you know, dietary choices, fasting, right? When, when they fast, what they fast and all that. Um, these things are all relevant. These are all forms. They're all forms of religion, right? Sorry, I'm trying to type that message. There we go. So now everybody should see that. Signs of the Times, January 11th, 1883, paragraph 13. Um, none of that stuff can take the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, so we, we can't ever forget that. You know, um, you know there, there's a place, right, for forms. We, we want to do things right. We want to do things decently. We want to do things orderly. We definitely want to do things biblically, right? We want to follow all those things. We want to do all those things. Um, but we have to understand, at the end of the day, uh, a form of religion won't cut it. A form of godliness won't cut it. We can have all the right things. We can have it all. We can have all the doctrines all lined out perfectly and everything. But without Christ, I mean, what good is it? It does us no good. we got to have Christ in the heart. And that's, and we consider baptism, that's the most important thing. Not what's said at baptism, but do these people recognize the authority? 
um, of God? Do they recognize, do they understand who God is? That's kind of important, right? Uh, do they understand what sin is? Because that's what separates us from God. Do they understand what the sanctuary is? Because that's how God is dealing with the sin problem. You know, those, those are the, the, the important things. Those are, you know, the fundamental things. These other things are, I don't want to say they're not important, but, you know, we can get caught up in all these mind thing, mind, um, minor things and, and it can distract us from doing our work. And I think that a lot of these, I know for sure, a lot of these uh, heresies, a lot of these fanaticism, uh, fanaticism and things that come up in the movement, uh, they're, they're slowing us down. They're designed to do that. They're designed to hinder us from doing our work, uh, to take it, you know, get us to come down from the wall, to get us from doing our work. And, you know, um, we, we have to study these things, right? If we've never heard them, we have to study them. We have to look at them. We have to become settled. Uh, that's what that's what it means to be uh, sealed, beloved. Uh, we're no, we're, it's not just a matter of keeping the Sabbath. Yeah, the Sabbath is the seal of the law. But what does it mean to be sealed? It means to become fully settled into the truth that you cannot be moved. Uh, that's what it means. And, you know, there's a lot of truth that, that you know, we need to look at. Um, and again, it, right at the top, who God is, what sin is in the sanctuary. I mean, what more do we need than that? I mean, we can we can talk about the other things, but, you know, that's. It's so important, so. Um, yeah, hopefully I've been able to express at least my view um, of, you know, my conclusions, what I've come to in this, this idea of baptismal formulas. Uh, I think, again, it's, it's a liberty of conscience must rule supreme. You know, we have to, you know, the local churches and, and the candidates or whatever, that has to be between them. Uh, we, we don't want to get in a position to where we're excluding people who have a conviction. I mean, have you ever tried to force somebody to do something they didn't want to do? Have you ever tried to compel somebody? I mean, it's, it's a real struggle. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, people keep on Sunday and worshiping the beast. I mean, we should compel them to worship the true God, right? Don't get me wrong. Um, but when people are, when I see people reaching and, and trying to grab, you know, people's consciences and control and harness other people's consciences on minor points, we can see this very plainly in diet. Has anybody ever seen this in diet? You ever seen this issue come up in diet where people want to start picking and choosing what people can eat and what they can't eat? Now, understand, there's black and white when it comes to diet, right? Amen, right? I mean, there's black and white. We, we can clearly see right and wrong. Uh, there's other things not so clear, right? The information is kind of conflicting on both sides, and, and maybe it's not quite so clear. For whatever reason, it's just kind of a gray area. But yet you'll see people want to come in, and they'll want to start uh, agitating those things. They'll want to start setting up tests about, you know, those types of things. And, and that's kind of how I see this baptism. It's one of those things where if, you know, if we try to hammer this thing down and exclude those who are baptizing, and again, it, it's not to, to, you know, to be argumentative, but the, the record in the, in the book of Acts is plain. I mean, we, have, we can speculate that they, what it really means is they baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can do that, and I, I, I'm going to give my brethren liberty to do that, uh, but I don't see that at all. Uh, I see that it's simply, you know, they took Christ's name as their authority. And, and there was even variations in the way it's recorded in the book of Acts. Name of the Lord, name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Christ. You know, again, kind of getting this concept of, you know, the disciples acted under the authority that they had. And it was given to them by Christ. Remember, Jesus said all authority had been given unto him. And they went forward in his name. I don't see no problem with that. And I don't see a problem with uh, those who read Matthew 28, 19. And they see that as, as important. To mention in the context of baptism and i understand the reason why they want to do that too because they don't want to exclude anybody right that's the whole thing we don't want to exclude the father the son or the holy spirit right and i don't i don't think that you know people who baptize the name of jesus are doing that um but that's that's the thought you know uh, that they're somehow being excluded right and you know i think you know to go back to the jealousy issue i think some people are being unnecessarily jealous for the father and the spirit I don't think there's, you know, some people have actually elevated Jesus, you know, to where he's up here with the father. And I'm telling you, Jesus is fine with his position. You can read that in Proverbs chapter eight, uh, verse 30, I think it was. I mean, he was always by the father's side. It, it, it brought him great joy. Jesus is OK with his position. We don't need to elevate him to a position he doesn't have thinking we're doing good. Right. Because some people, they think they're doing a good thing by putting Jesus way up here. But he's a little short. And because he's a little short, some people might think, man, you're bringing him way down here. No, no, no. It's because you put him up here and we just have to bring him down a little bit because, you know, that's what the Bible teaches. There, there is a difference. You can't have you can't have a council of peace between two uh, co-equal omniscient beings. It just doesn't make sense because they, they already know each other's words. Right. Um, 
some of you may be familiar with that movie, The Matrix. It was a, a, a popular movie <laughs> in the world, right? And it's got the Trinity in it, right? There's a character named Trinity, by, and, and the, the lead character becomes the son at the end, right? Um, uh, there was a reason I was going to say that, though. Uh, sorry, my mind changed gears. Uh, the Matrix, The Matrix. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot that thought. I had a thought I was, I was wanting to, to draw into that. Uh, I hate when that happens, I apologize. But anyways, um, you know, baptism is important. The ordinance of baptism is important. It is uh, the entrance into the church, as, as we're told. It's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental. But again, look at the fundamentals. Uh, even though men like James White and others baptized using uh, the, the formula in Matthew 28, 19, you won't find that reference in the fundamentals. It's not there. They didn't put that text on there. And they could have, very easily could have. Uh, but they didn't. And, um, you know, I think that that, that, that kind of sticks out in my mind. Um, and again, you know, it's just a matter of conscience, I think, liberty of conscience on, on the point. Because, you know, people can say, yeah, right there, it says plainly, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the other group can say, yeah, but it says plainly, they baptize in the name of Jesus, right? So why don't we harmonize the two? Why don't, why don't we read Acts of the Apostles 28, paragraph 2? And, and read how the disciples did take Christ's name as their watchword, and they did baptize, um, you know, in, in that method. I mean, again, I, I see threefold name. I see, uh, I see the name of Jesus. I don't, I don't necessarily make a distinction. I, I've harmonized the two in my mind uh, that to baptize the name of Jesus doesn't exclude the Father and the Son. I think that's a logical fallacy, and that's ultimately what we would have to believe, that to baptize the name of Jesus is to directly disobey a command of, of Christ, which is clearly recorded in the book of Acts, you know, multiple transgressions of not following Jesus' command, uh, but we have to believe that, and then we have to, um, um, uh, we have to, you know, exclude people from the church, we, we have to, um, you know, so I'm, I'm just not willing to do that, and I hope, you know, from what I'm hearing here, it sounds like, you know, a lot of people have, have kind of looked at this too, and, and understand that, you know, that's, um, that's kind of how it, you know, that's kind of how it works out. It's, it's, it was not meant to be a specific formula because if it were, why were it not recorded like that? Um, you know, that, that's a very logical question. I mean, we can speculate all day long about, you know, the disciples, they really baptized this way. You know, we could do that, but, you know, um, we just, I don't think it's a good idea. So I want to go ahead and close. I've talked a lot. I, I want to give, I want to hear other, um, any other comments or feedback. I see brother Sammy's got his hand up. So um, I'm going to go ahead and cut my mic for, for now. Yeah, thank you so much, brother Robert, in the, uh, for the submissions. And uh, brethren, this has been a blessing. Like any other day, we have about uh, 18 minutes to give your final submissions. And if you have a really pressing question on this matter, you are free now to ask that question. So brother Sammy, perhaps uh, that will be categorized under final submissions and you have a right to go ahead. Any other person can comment after Brother Sami. Karibu, Brother Sami. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Zadok, and uh, thank you, Brother uh, Mosina, for that uh, submissions. I'd like to say this uh, that uh, about baptism and uh, rebaptism. It is uh, maybe because people don't understand what is baptism and rebaptism that uh, maybe the reason why extremes can be taken, but uh, when you look at uh, the book of uh, Romans chapter six, verse four, it talks about uh, being buried with Jesus Christ uh, and raised by the glory of the Father into newness of life. You see that triad in the threefold name uh, uh, being in application there that Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit are all uh, included in this. And uh, uh, so you, you, you can decide to baptize in the name of Jesus. You can decide to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No problem. The point I want to make is this. We are not, um, and I can say I'm not uh, maybe opening a way that uh, you can just uh, uh, do anything you want in baptism because baptism is an ordinance by the Lord himself, and uh, it should be approached with the uh, solemnity as even the Holy Communion is approached with solemnity because they are the two ordinances that Christ left with us. And they are not just things to be joked about, but uh, uh, things to be taken uh, uh, seriously uh, uh, when you are doing it so that uh, 
it may not be just a formal thing that you are doing. Uh, when uh, again, you look at uh, the name Jesus, we are talking about the name Jesus uh, or what is, what is done in Acts and what is done in the book of Matthew chapter 28. What does the name Jesus actually mean? The name Jesus means God is salvation. And we know that uh, everything Christ takes from the Father and then he gives unto us uh, through the Spirit and the tide of beneficence goes back through him as the channel. He is the in-between uh, man and, and the Father. And so when you look at that, that uh, the name Jesus means God uh, uh, is uh, our salvation, then we can see that uh, it can apply to the threefold name. And so there's no problem with that. But also when uh, you consider some other points that uh, in Acts chapter 19, when um, uh, they were asked, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they were told, we have never had such a thing. Then uh, in the book of AA 282, we are told that um, uh, Paul was able to repeat the Great Commission uh, before he baptized them in the name of Jesus. What does that really mean to me? That uh, before somebody goes into the water, they, they have to be instructed uh, about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit so that they may know that actually what are they being baptized into? What are they taking themselves upon? Now, our, our brother Robert brought out also a quote from uh, 60, uh, 91.2, where actually uh, uh, it starts by that um, uh, baptism is an entrance into the, into the spiritual kingdom, something of that kind. And then at the bottom, actually, it tells us that uh, before a person can get into this kingdom, he has to receive an impress of the divine name the Lord our righteousness. Now, when you consider that, it is so important that uh, before any kind of baptism is uh, 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 done, that uh, the people are thoroughly instructed in the way of the Lord and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and be helped, or uh, I don't know the word that uh, you, you, can, uh, you can use, uh, be drawn or be prompted to give their life fully to Jesus Christ so that they may receive uh, the, the impress of the divine name, the Lord, our righteousness. In 1888 messages, uh, page 756, she says that one point of interest that will swallow all the others is the Lord, our righteousness. And that is the name, the divine impress that uh, we have to receive. The book of Philippians chapter three, verse nine says that uh, Jesus have received righteousness of God, which he gives unto us. And so uh, whichever way that we will baptize, either in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, or uh, the book of Acts, uh, with the variation of the name, Lord Jesus, then in the name of Jesus and all that stuff, uh, we are to make sure that um, we are not just uh, barring people. We are not uh, just only uh, uh, making people wait and they come out and they say that we have been baptized, uh, we are members of the church. No, we have to really uh, 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 try to bring the people to the point that uh, they understand what they are taking about. And uh, it is like uh, making a covenant, actually. When you are being baptized, you are entering into a covenant into a family that you are not part of. Because when Satan brought sin, we were alienated from the family of God. And we became part of the family of Adam that fell. But now here comes the second Adam, and he is the kinsman redeemer. And so in baptism, it is like taking a covenant back into the uh, family of God, where actually we have a human representative there who is Jesus Christ, who took uh, part of uh, our humanity. And so it's not just about we are being baptized in the name, we are being baptized in the name, but uh, what are you being baptized in? Are you being baptized in the uh, in, in Lord our righteousness? This is something that should concern us most. It doesn't mean that we do away with the uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 in the book of Acts, but uh, also we be careful that uh, it doesn't turn out to be just formalism as uh, the Jewish continued into their form and ceremonies, not knowing that uh, the Lord had departed into that temple. Thank you so much.
And uh, thank you very just, much, uh, Lord, just, just, just uh, the last point, maybe uh, I, I can read this uh, just uh, for my final submission. I, I thought that this was important uh, and uh, I put it in my notes. If you differ with your brethren as to your understanding of the grace of Christ and the operations of his spirit, you should not make these differences prominent. You view the matter from one point, another just as devoted to God views the same question from another point and speaks of the thing that make the deepest impression on his mind. Another viewing it from a still different point presents another face and how foolish it is to get into contention over these things when there is really nothing to contend about. Let God work on the mind and impress the heart. Thank you, brothers. Back to Brother Zadok and uh, Brother Robert. Sami. Thank you so much, Brother Sami, for that. And may the Lord bless you. Uh, Brother Patrick, you also have your hand up. Please uh, feel free. Uh, greetings, uh, everyone. Um, I came in late. I wasn't able to uh, hear much, but um, I've heard the brother presenting. That should be Robert. And, um, and I've heard Brother Sami present. And I've read uh, some couple of the uh, um, propositions shared on the chat. And uh, this subject um, is very interesting to me. And because uh, I, I, to share my personal testimony, <clears throat> by the year 2017, I was convicted that I was ready for baptism. And in my mind, it wasn't re-baptism because I'd come to believe firmly that when you're baptized into error, it's not baptism. Um, I had read the history I had read the history of the Anabaptists, who the known history records that it's the Anabaptists. Uh, that's not what they like being called. They preferred being called Baptists, but those who didn't like them would call them Anabaptists. That when they first did the baptism of immersion that is recorded, they, when they were accused of being Anabaptists, they said, no, we are Baptists. That is, we don't baptize twice but that which we received in the first time wasn't baptism because they would say the form actually sprinkling and all that wasn't baptism. And indeed, even further, you and I know much better that, that baptism is into truth. And the only way to find the truth of the father is Jesus Christ. And um, I, ha I really, I have had different cases from the time I believed I wanted to be baptized in 2017. It took me two years to find a baptism because I was baptized in 2019, I believe. But if I would want to believe that if I died in between there and I was faithful, I will get my lot with the thief who repented, even if I didn't get the chance for the water because I was convicted, but no one was there to baptize me. No one was sure whether we should be baptized or that. And my first teacher on the forms of words to teach to uh, uh, a minister will use during baptism um, shared to me that it's the name Jesus. And uh, I usually when somebody teaches me something, I'll go and take my time to study it for myself. So I started and uh, I came by the year 2017 now towards the end, I was sure I need baptism. And I was so convicted that the way to baptize is in the name Jesus. Now, with time, when I would teach that, some people receive it um, gladly, but brethren who believe like me, some will not be very comfortable uh, because I didn't seem to say, let's baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, but now I just read one quote and I, I read one quote, um, I think uh, a year ago, and I realized I don't need to hurt anybody. I don't need to make anybody feel like I'm, 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 I'm being unfair. I'm, I'm stealing their liberty of conscience. And now I totally accept that anyone can baptize the way they prefer, the way they prefer. But personally, I haven't baptized anybody already, but I will preach to people and those who want to be baptized. Most of the time, 
I will prepare them that the name which I will use or the minister will use, in this case, the minister who's close to me nearby will use the name Jesus. And if they're uncomfortable, I'll tell them you'll still be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit if that's what you prefer. But I've made cases over time, like I can remember when I was in Ramoya area, I taught that I was given an opportunity to teach about baptism and I taught and since people were being prepared for baptism, I told them they'd be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, one brother had a problem with that. And I showed him the, I showed him a, um, um, uh, Sister White speaking about the matter of John's disciples trying to question the right of uh, Jesus' disciples to baptize. And I told the brother, hey, you will be baptized the way you are comfortable in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what makes you comfortable. And you believe like us. So you'll be baptized like that. But now sadly, he said he doesn't want that. He wanted everyone else to be baptized in them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When in fact, the majority had preferred to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now he was in the minority, he was one. And I told him, brother, you will be baptized the way you want. But somehow, he said now he postponed his baptism. I don't know whether he has ever been baptized since then because he wanted everyone else to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet their majority had accepted they wanted to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And I told him, we have no problem because for me, like I've heard um, Robert share here, is that when I read the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I see the name Jesus. That's what I see. That's what I see. That is, if you baptize any man in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'll just hear the name Jesus. And if you baptize in the name of the Lord, I'll hear the name Jesus. If you baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll just hear the name Jesus. And most important, one verse, I have a lot really to say on this subject. I'll have wanted to say much more than I can for now, but because of time, I will just remind us. I will ask a few questions. Who's the way to the Father? Jesus. Who's the ladder to the Father? Jesus. Who manifested and declared the character of the Father? Jesus. Who is our only mediator? Jesus. By whom do we receive reconciliation of the Father? Jesus. And so by whom do we receive the spirit of the Father? Jesus. And so it's all about the mediatorship of Jesus, such that when I read even our pioneers were so clear, while they had a way they had in their mind, they were so clear, such that in fundamental principle number four and five, they captured the, when speaking of the ordinance, they capture on immersion, but they don't give the words. Because for sure they knew it will have been a very it will have been stretching if they tried to put the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit there, and it will have been a bit dangerous on their part to do that somehow. So they left it open so that uh, anyone may see as they are convicted there. So finally, um, just one text, um, um, Ephesians chapter three verse five. Ephesians chapter three verse five, so that. And I want to thank God for what our brother Sami has shared, that it's a God is the source of all things. He's the source of this baptism. He's the source of forgiveness. And Jesus is the only way for us to receive those things of the Father, which are the blessings, which are what we need. So Ephesians 3.15 will tell us that everything in heaven and on earth is named after the Father. And the name Jesus, as our brother uh, Sami has shared, it means God saves us. That's the name. That's the name of the Father in the Son. And so um, I want to thank God for the sharing. Personally, today where I am at my faith, I will gladly, uh, if I was to baptize anyone, I will baptize in the name of Jesus. But if anyone asked me to baptize them in the name of the Father and Son, uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I will joyfully baptize them. So um, that, that is how I see it. And I believe um, if we see it that way, that when I hear the name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I hear the name Jesus. When I hear the name Jesus, I hear the, uh, the Father, I hear his power, which is the Spirit, and I hear his Son, the only way for the Father to give us the Spirit. And so if we see that that way, uh, we cannot have this controversy. Lastly, nowhere did our pioneers ever had uh, an issue on this matter. So I, 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 if we are honest and faithful and seeking unity, we must never have a controversy on this matter. And, um, and um, in fact, the only time this matter came up as an issue was between 1931 and 1941. And for what reason? 
for what reason? The church had become Trinitarian and making Matthew 28, 19 sound Trinitarian or what, they said everyone else must baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is when we, we, we check history, that it is 1941, in the church manual, they placed that baptism must be in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, making it speak to, making it speak to Trinitarianism. Meaning, if it was open in those other days, then um, um, we, 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 we who are free now must not go to that line. Finally, something I need to say, I am in a group with Tanzanians and in the, in the world, many of those who are Trinitarians, the only verse they're presenting to support Trinity is Matthew 28, 19. Now, brethren there who don't believe in the Trinity, every time they respond to Matthew 28, 19, they will post uh, text from Acts showing that, hey, how did the disciples hear it? And so you realize now the brethren from Tanzania, in this case, most likely if they wanted to be baptized, I, 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 I perceive they'll want to be baptized in the name of Jesus because the people pushing the Trinity there are using Matthew 28, 19. And I will not force them to accept it when they, are, they, they, they now believe in order to, 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 to say no, no, that is not Trinitarian, look at Acts. And I also know of a family who totally don't want to hear that baptism in the name of Father and Son at all, because of the many issues that, that have been pushed about Matthew 28, 19, that it's Trinitarian. So this family of an old man and an old woman who don't want that, I will not bother them. Because number one, I know they believe in the Father. I know they believe the Spirit is the power of God and to salvation, which we receive by Jesus. And so I will not want to even try to bother them. Hey, believe this and that. I will just baptize them in the name of Jesus. But I say again, this must no quarrel. Any brother baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise the Lord. We praise the Lord sincerely. So, um, and, and those who are conscientiously baptized in the name of Jesus, uh, we should thank God for all of them. So God bless you all. I've just tried to truncate what I wanted to say on this subject. I had a lot to say about it. God's grace. Thank you, Brother Patrick. As you want to close, uh, we are thankful for that. I would just want to remind us that Perhaps it came late, but we established the fact that the Bible is a perfect chain of truth. It is our only tool for evangelism. And the moment we have a problem with any verse, we are destroying our own weapon that we can use against Satan. And so when any brother has a problem with any verse, it is our first duty to establish them to believe that the Bible is a perfect chain of truth. It is handed down from God and it is our duty as missionaries to establish their faith in the Bible. If they don't understand a section of the Bible the way they should, it is not their duty to have a problem with it. They should go in prayer and ask the Lord what the Lord means by uh, that particular verse. That should be our duty. So our first duty, even before the form of words, is to agree that Matthew chapter 28 and the sections of act are valid biblical verses They're valid biblical verses and we have been able to prove that but as to the form of words that must be used we are not going to restrict any minister or any candidate to be baptized by certain strict form of words we are going to allow them to exercise their liberty of conscience as to how they understand the way the Lord convicts them, rather, how they should baptize. Otherwise, I do not think that there is any other person who's raising their hand. Our time looks like it's up. So I want us to stop there for today, unless this is a pressing matter. Uh, uh, brother, uh, brother, uh, brother Robert, uh, you'll be able to answer that. And perhaps uh, from Ken, I will take this one also from Ken. Who is qualified to perform the rite of baptism? I think we will take some minutes to answer that. You'll excuse us for the additional minutes. So uh, take it up, brother. I just, I only wanted to, to take a minute. I just wanted to thank Patrick for his uh, testimony. I was, I was encouraged by it. I appreciate what he said. 
Um, and I also want to remind everybody what the ordinance of baptism is. It is we're baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not in the life, death, and resurrection of the Father or the Spirit. So, um, you know, again, everything points to Jesus in the Bible, right? Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. Uh, again, the whole, the whole controversy in heaven was over Christ's position, not the Father's, right? Uh, it was Christ's position. And so, you know, um, I see this as an attack on Christ. I see it as an attack on the church. But I think that as Christians, um, you know, we can uh, study this together. We can look at it. And I think that most people should be able to be able to harmonize uh, the two different positions and not, not fall into either one of those ditches. That's my prayer anyways, is that we can find harmony um, and, and not, and not division, not this, uh, disunity and, and division and, um, separation. So, uh, that was all I wanted to share. Um, I see some, oh, I guess there is some chats there in the comments. I don't know. You mentioned a, a question, brother. Yeah, Zadok, that's a so question. That's a question. question. Uh, that okay. was a direct question to, it's, it's sent to me anyways, because I'm the moderator, but I will bring it to the public, uh, who is qualified to perform the exercise to baptize. So please, someone to react to that because our brother could be eager to know. Thank you. Yeah, well, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think Pastor Daniel Mesa, uh, I'm thinking it seems, it seems like he, he gave a message on baptism uh, regarding who, who could baptize, um, or who was qualified to baptize. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to give that answer. I mean, I, I think that, you know, if you're a minister of the Lord, if you're doing the Lord's work and, and the, you know, the, the opportunity to baptize somebody presents itself, then uh, you're qualified. <laughs> you're qualified. I don't think it's, uh, you know, you don't have to go through any school. You don't have to get a diploma. Uh, you don't have to wear a specific clothes, although I, I think the ordinance, I mean, it should be solemn. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to, you know, garments, you know, wearing certain stuff and, and you know, the form of baptism. I'm not against it. Um, you know, but as far as who could administer that, I mean, I think that, you know, whoever is a servant of the Lord, if, if somebody's a minister and, and they're ministering and, and baptism comes up, then that's it. Now you, now you have to understand, you know, we don't have a lot of churches. The, the people are so scattered. That's why we're having these meetings. We're trying to, to bring together so that way we can come together and present a united front, um, you know. And so we're, we're, that's the kind of situation we're in. It's not like we have a, some places might have a church. They might have a local church and a pastor, but not everybody has that. Uh, or there's a, there's a great distance, you know, and, and so, you know, there, these are all factors that we have to consider um, in relation to, to baptism, rebaptism, and, and all of these things, you know, who, who's, who's qualified to baptism. So uh, that, that's a question that, that maybe um, needs a little bit more time. I don't know. I'll, I'll let somebody else um, answer that if they want to. But I just wanted to, to reiterate the fact that, that baptism, it, we're baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what baptism is a symbol of. So, you know, in the context of formulas and, and I like what uh, Patrick said, you know, you know, does the, does the, the baptismal candidate, the, does that person have a proper understanding of God and sin and the plan of salvation? Cause that's what matters. You know, do, do they have that, that basic information that they need? And, and that's, that's what's, that's, what's important in my mind uh, more so than what the minister says right before they take him under the water, you know, uh, it's, it's what's in that person's heart and in their mind. That's, that's what's important. So uh, that's all I have. Well, the Lord, thank you, uh, Brother Robert, for that. I don't know if there's any person who has anything to say about that question. Finally, before we pray. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Brother Patrick, you put up a quote and, oh, is it? Um, Indeed, it's not to sink to the death of Christ. So if one believes like that and they prefer being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I am fine. Praise the Lord. We just need to be sure that Jesus is the only way to the Father, the Son, uh, to the Father, the only ladder to him, the Father. No any other way to the Father, only Jesus the way. If it is clear, I see no worry at all. Blessings. Thank you, Brother Patrick. God bless you. Okay, so brethren, um, I'm sure that we will find more time perhaps to talk about uh, who is qualified to baptize if, if it be a subject for another time. But I think uh, Brother Robert has given um, a, short, a short answer to that that I hope would be helpful. 
that those who are called of God and whom the Lord has given a special commission to, to work for him as ministers, uh, gospel workers. Um, and that opportunity presents itself. And especially if such a time as this, there's no any other person who could do their ordinance, then they should go ahead. The Lord sends them. But we could discuss that a little bit deeper another time because I know there could be a lot of questions arising from that. We want to close at that point today, brethren. And I'm so thankful for uh, uh, Brother Robert for you coming to join us today. Uh, uh, may the Lord bless you in your ministry and your, your family. And I would just want to ask you to pray for us as we end this meeting. All right. Well, I want to thank you again for having me and uh, inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, I think this is what we need as a people. We need to come together and have these types of discussions and meetings and, and try to hash these things out. But uh, with that said, I would invite those of you who can to kneel and we'll have a closing prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together like this. Uh, we thank you for the technology that makes all this happen. We thank you for all those that have showed up. And Father, we uh, thank you that we can discuss a topic such as this, Father. And, and we pray that it's, it's become clear in, in some people's minds, Father. And if not, that it will, uh, that you will help, uh, help us to be able to work together with our brothers and sisters, Father, who may not see uh, things exactly the same on this issue of baptism, Father. But if they understand the greater part of the fundamental, Father, we, we're okay with that, with um, different uh, formulas and words. So uh, we just pray that um, you can help us to find a unity in the midst of this diversity. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.